Welcome to Capital Community College. We're so glad that all of you could join us tonight. We are recording this, uh, this lecture tonight and discussion, and so this will be available on the Hartford Heritage website, which can be found on the front page. The link is on the front page of the home page of the Capital Community College website. Um, my name is Jeff Partridge. I'm the chair of the Humanities Department here at Capital Community College. I am uh, also the director of the Hartford Heritage Project and uh, therefore overseeing with, with our friend Bill Hosley uh, this lecture series. We're so glad that you could join us tonight. Um, I, I want to first of all thank our sponsors. Uh, it's so important to have sponsorship for a series like this. these. Um, so I want to thank Connecticut Humanities for funding it, for the support of Capital Community College and the Capital Community College Foundation. And speaking of the Capital Community College Foundation, we are uh, having our virtual uh, gala to raise money to support students in need uh, at Capital Community College and other worthy projects that we undertake. So I would ask uh, that if you feel led to, that you would uh, 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 donate to, to uh, the link that I'll be putting on the chat shortly. Um, a few things about way, the way things will work tonight. If you send me a message, on, if you write a message on chat, it only comes to me. Uh, and when I respond, it, you know, I can respond to everyone or to you individually. Um, but questions will be done aud by audio. So wait until the end. We'll have a Q&A time at the end. Uh, you, there's a virtual raise your hand function, so make use of that. And we will, uh, and I will uh, then ask you to, I'll put on your microphone and you can speak. There's no video for the attendees but, uh, to, to come through on the screen, but your voices will come through loud and clear. Um, I am delighted to have uh, a Dr. Fiona Vernal here uh, to, to speak on this, this outstanding topic. I know we're all excited to hear what she has to say about it and to see the, the slides that she's prepared. Uh, just a little bit about uh, uh, Fiona. Fiona Vernal uh, has a PhD from Yale University and is the Associate Professor of History and Africana Studies and Director of the new initiative EPIC, Engaged Public Oral and Community Histories at the University of Connecticut. Building on oral histories, archival research, and iterative exhibitions, her research chronicles African-American, Puerto Rican, and West Indian migration and settlement in the greater Hartford region. Please welcome Dr. Fiona Vernon. Good evening to those gathering in person and online. I hear that we're about 106 in number. I thank you for agreeing to spend a little bit of your Wednesday evening with us. Thank you to Jeff and Bill for organizing this series, to Capital Community College for hosting, to the Capital Community College Foundation, and to Connecticut Humanities for underwriting this series. Connecticut Humanities has done so much across the state to support programming that demonstrates the relevance and purpose of the, of the humanities to creating an informed citizenry and creating a space to engage in dialogue and problem solving around pressing social issues and to learn, Connecticut, learn about Connecticut's history. Connecticut Humanities also supported the exhibition that explores themes of migration and settlement on which this talk draws. For those of you who may be interested in that exhibition, I am happy to send it along uh, to you. Um, Jeff can drop my email um, in, the, in the chat and you can fetch it from there. Finally, I would like to thank the Hartford History Center at the Hartford Public Library for giving me access to the treasure trove of their archives, um, <clears throat> to Brenda Miller, to Jasmine Augusto, to Maureen Hare for going down all of the research rabbit holes um, with me and making it possible um, for me to present some of this information to you. Um, today. A significant proportion of the images that I'm going to be showing you, as well as the content, is drawn from the collection of the Hartford History Center, and I would 
welcome anyone who would like to join me in this research because every single hour and a half increment that I now spend there, I find out that there's probably 15 or 20 dissertations that can be written <laughs> out of that collection. Um, at UConn, I'd like to thank Jason and Brendan, um, my chair, Mark Healy, Emma Amador, Anne Gebeline, Alexis Boylan, Amanda Canada, and Heather Parker, who I consider my crowded stage of UConn folks who always cheer me on. And every time I say, I have an idea for another exhibition, or I would like to work on this project, and I need a team of 15 undergraduate students, never never hesitate to provide me with all of the support um, that I need. So thank you to my UConn folks. Today I'm going to be talking about an integrated framework for African American, Puerto Rican, and West Indian histories of Hartford. This is a new project for me, and I should confess that I'm a South African historian. That has been my primary training. I've also been trained in African American history, and so it's that latter training that I turn to. And in an effort to understand the African American experience here, especially through my public exhibitions, the main feedback that I've gotten is that this is our story too. This is a Puerto Rican story. This is a West Indian story. So as I attempt to provide narratives about how Hartford became an African American space, I found that the same intellectual framework was very useful for understanding how Hartford became the city that it is today. So it's in this context that I'm trying to integrate um, this framework, I am at the very beginning, um, I am at the very beginning of this, and I welcome all of your um, suggestions uh, this evening. 1947 was a very good year for Lovely Man. Lovely Man was an African-American migrant who had come of age in Montezuma, Georgia, and had set his sights on migrating north. His unmooring from the south and his tethering to the north was a protracted process involving reconnaissance missions to other states to figure out, maybe I should go to New Jersey, maybe I should go to New York. It involved circular migration back and forth from Hartford and New York and to Georgia. It involved secondary migration. It involved chain migration and return migration. All patterns captured by Isabel Wilkerson's monumental Warmth of Other Sons and Saida Hartman's more recent Wayward Lives. For yet another Hartford resident and community leader, Ana Coto Nunez, known affectionately to her family as Tita, the great unmooring had begun, begun with her husband, who had taken a job in, um, from Puerto Rico to go to Virginia to work in the tobacco fields. From Virginia, given that he had extensive experience working in tobacco, he then came to Connecticut to work in Connecticut's iconic shade tobacco fields. Senora Nunez would use her voice and her experience for a lifetime of legacy, sorry, a lifetime of advocacy around migrant rights and around improving housing conditions in Hartford. She served on the Puerto Rican Parade Committee and she, provided, she served as a social service advocate in, in the North End. Her church, Sacred Heart, um, award, honored her um, many times as a pillar in the community. For Sydney Barnett, a previous stint as part of the Legion of West Indian Workers recruited to build the Panama Canal made coming to the United States much easier. He answered the call of the U.S. for West Indians to aid in the war effort by providing relief for shade tobacco growers and other farming and industrial outfits that were facing severe labor shortages because their laborers had been recruited for the effort. He would purchase a home on Brook Street in Hartford, one of the earliest West Indian homeowners to do so, and he lived there for over 50 years. In fact, the only thing that got that man away from his house, which he was very proud of, um, was growing older and becoming ill and needing, and needing extended care. Miss Nunez, Mr. Barnett, shown here, and Mr. Mann, 
are not famous. You won't find them in a history book, at least not until I finish the one that I'm trying to work on. <laughs> but they are just three examples of the stories that help us frame what I am calling three great migrations an approach that captures how West Indians, Puerto Ricans, and African Americans became the majority of the population of the city of Hartford. Here's a commemorative stamp showing West Indian laborers and honoring West Indian laborers for their very important contribution uh, hmm. to the Panama Canal. <clears throat> These three great migrations and the three examples that I have used here document this great unmooring and tethering. And I am intentionally repeating that because there's only so many times you can say migration. And I like that conceptualization. And that's one of the framings that I would like to contribute uh, to the scholarship is to help us think about what it means to get, to move, to be mobile, um, to be unmoored, and then to try to connect to another place, in this case, specifically Hartford. Another part of this concept of tethering that I want to launch or frame is that once people got here, they moved around so many times in Hartford, sometimes 10 times, sometimes 11 times. And I think tethering will help us to get to unpack what that meant. Let me turn quickly um, to my methods so that we can understand how in the last 80 years, Hartford has become a majority minority city. And that majority minority consists of the three groups that I will focus on. So my sources are varied. The research um, that this project rests on, rests, the research rests on the notion that everyone is an expert in their own life story and their experiences, especially as communities of color. And, our, and their experiences are relevant for making sense of the past and constructing reliable, reliable narratives and authoritative histories. I try to unearth these experiences in a variety of ways. I privilege oral histories as one way to overcome some of the silences that are in the traditional archives that usually lead folks to say, well, I can't really write about that because I don't have any sources to do that. Oral histories allow me to explore the relationship between experience and perception, between reality and consciousness, and it provides a space for my narrators to be co-creators in framing their own life histories. Each of the three individuals that I, that I started off with, so lovely men, either they're family members or they have given me permission to use their stories and have provided particular details about their family members, they or their family members' um, histories um, to share. And so this allows my narrators and their family members to be producers of knowledge and to participate this on participate in the production of knowledge on equal ground. And so with 106 people in the audience, I think there are probably a few of you who've put up with my attempts to interview you, and I thank those of you who have already been interviewed and allowed me to share um, your stories. I, I find it um, really heartening that even the folks who say I'm going to talk to you for 20 minutes and that's the only time I'm giving you are still sitting in front of me an hour and a half later and then mm -hmm. I have to do a follow-up interview. Wow. So as long as that continues to happen, I think I'm barking up the right tree. <laughs> The Hartford History Center is a treasure trove of Hartford history. These include everything from the reports of the Housing Authority to the history of Hartford streets. I know that doesn't sound like scintillating reading, but uh, I got to go through um, Robert Moses's arterial report, and because of that, I needed to document the transition to the motor car and the huge collection of Hartford Street history that is in the Hartford History Center actually allowed me to connect some of those arguments that Robert Moses was making about the, right, the need for highways, right? Um, there's, there's the record of the town clerk, there's voting records, and right now on view online, they have an excellent exhibition um, on women's suffrage and African-American women's um, votes in 1920. There are community-based studies, neighborhood profiles, and a splendid 
map collection that is probably going to take me another year to, to go through. It is like drinking from a fire hose. <laughs> Across the street from the Hartford History Center, I have to try to duck into the deeds office. So I've been cheating on the deeds office quite a bit because I can't seem to leave the Hartford History Center to make it over there. But occasionally I am there to get the name. So that's where I found the name of Mr. Barnett and every transaction he ever had related mm. to his house, mm. right? And this is helping me to reconstruct what the patterns of West Indian home ownership is like. We know anecdotally that West Indians are among the largest West homeowners um, in the city um, of Hartford, um, but that hasn't actually been documented by going to the record. Um, finally, um, there is the State Library, um, of course, with its voluminous records and newspaper archives. Then there's the obituary. <laughs> Hundreds of obituaries. I am dreaming about people um, <laughs> from their obituary. It, I, am, I am being haunted. Um, it may sound a little morbid. Um, to read through hundreds of obituaries. But sometimes when I am trying to get a trace of what African American life or Puerto Rican life or West Indian life like is like, sometimes that is the only piece of information um, I can access. Obituaries then, despite haunting me, are fascinating, fascinating moments of self-representation and the representation of origins, education, ambitions, and employment. Sometimes they're the only evidence I have, as I said, and this is the kind of thing that you can find out from an obituary. You can find out how segregated ce cemeteries can be um, in the city. You can find out how deep diasporic connections are when people choose to send their bodies back home or choose to have multiple services, one in Hartford and one in Puerto Rico, or one in Hartford and one in Jamaica. Attached to this, of course, is Ancestry.com, which helps me to track the movements, this small tethering that happens um, in Hartford um, over time so that I can use the city directories that are embedded in Ancestry to figure out how many times someone moved in Hartford and to find out that sometimes it's seven, eight, and nine, and nine times. So as people move in and out of the official records, I am trying to triangulate all of these sources to help tell the story. And I thought it was important that I shared um, that approach that approach with you so that you can understand what it is that I am trying to do. Finally, to local and community archives, which are undervalued and are at risk. Um, by community archives, I mean, for example, the voluminous archives of the West Indian Social Club. The West Indian Social Club has one of the wealthiest troves of um, private um, archives that document the experiences of the men who founded the social club in 1950. And they kept everything, everything. They kept the bar receipts, <laughs> rolled up the little pieces of paper <laughs> that came out of the cash register. They mm. held on to everything because the people who founded the club were very conscious that they were a part of history, that they were making history. Mm. But they were also conscious of the surveillance that they would be under. And they wanted to make sure that if the tax man showed up or if the policeman showed up, they could document and prove everything. Uh, that they were thinking about that and fearful of that in 1950, and we are still thinking about that and fearful of that in 2020 speaks volumes. Like other groups who have made Hartford their home at different times, whether we're talking about the Polish population, the Jewish population, or the Italian population, social, benevolent, and religious organizations have played an important role in creating a sense of place and in being a space for community organizing. And so on the eve of the West Indian population and the Puerto Rican population beginning to settle in Hartford, Hartford is undergoing tremendous demographic changes already. So it's not just African Americans and Puerto Ricans or West Indians who are changing the demographic profile. Hartford is already attracting a huge range of people 
Um, Susan Campbell, the journalist, likes to talk about how people come to Hartford and bounce, <laughs> right? And so just between 1900 and 1930, you can see that Hartford's population goes from almost 80,000 to 164, um, to 164,000. Nilda Ortiz, Olga Mele, and Maria Colon Sanchez are just three of the chorus of women who have played a fundamental role in advocating for Puerto Ricans as they settled in Hartford. Their advocacy would span housing, education, employment, and the improvement of the health and welfare and the political participation of Puerto Ricans in the life of the city. Their work included pushing for holding mass in Spanish when the community had been relegated to the to the basement of St. Peter's on Main Street and St. Patrick, St. Anthony, and then Sacred Heart Church, also Sagrado Corazon. Sacred Heart was witness to what I will call a wave of community succession, which led to church succession, as it had been home to German migrants before it was grudgingly well um, opened to Puerto Ricans. The church would nurture the San Juan Community Center and serve as a funnel for all kinds of services and outreach to the community. Uh, Nilda, who is a Yukon alum, had deep roots in social services, and as my Yukon History Department colleague Emma Amador has demonstrated in her eagerly anticipated book, the Puerto Rican state followed their citizens as they saw as they sought and were encouraged to find employment in the United States. They followed their citizens through the Migration Division, which had 30 plus branches in all different cities, including a branch in Hartford. That story remains to be told. I would like to help tell it. Um, women like Nilda Ortiz had deep roots in social work, and this ethos followed other activists in the community as they sought to close the gaps in social services in the city of Hartford. And it was very important, and it's very important, um, Emma Amador has reminded, reminded us what that relationship is between social services and why social services feature so prominently in early community organizing, precisely because of the gap in services for migrants. Um, these Latina women, these Latina community um, organizations, which um, Emma um, features in her work, um, they shone a spotlight on the poverty, inequality, and discrimination that Puerto Rican migrants face, both as migrant workers when they signed on for contract labor with the Shade Tobacco um, Growers, and then when they decided to settle in Hartford. And on many occasions in the 1940s, um, Hartford um, turned a blind eye to the needs of their new migrant um, populations and wished them away. In fact, um, many people in city government very willingly, very willingly, very publicly um, said they're going to have a really hard time here and eventually they're going to leave. Mm -hmm. um, and this was the kind of neglect, malign neglect, that a lot of Puerto Ricans um, faced as they settled to the city, in the city. Um, for those of you who are familiar with Hartford, it's the Clay Arsenal neighborhood um, that Puerto Ricans first began putting down roots in the city and housing discrimination and housing shortages and housing code violations followed them from that very moment, which is why housing advocacy features so prominently in what the community activists um, focus on. And so from the very those very early days, um, from the era of African-American migration and African-American migrants facing um, significant housing shortages and being shut out of certain neighborhoods in Hartford to Puerto Rican um, citizens coming in and settled and being shut out of certain neighborhoods or being told that they can't live in certain communities because they have too many children um, to people wondering if they're going to bring their machetes with them and if they're a public danger. Um, so from that era of housing shortages, you have this very vibrant um, tradition of tenant organizing and tenant activism that you see threaded through all the way to the more recent No More Slum Wars movement. Here's the interior of Sacred Heart Church. Mm -hmm. Many of you know this magnificent edifice. Mm -hmm. All right. In one of my oral histories uh, with one of 
the community organizer is Josh Serrano, um, shown here. Um, Josh, uh, I was fascinated by his tattoos, which is sort of like a love letter to um, Puerto Rico. Um, so he allowed me to take a picture <laughs> um, of his arm. Um, Josh Serrano, shown here, um, traces his, the roots of his consciousness um, had, as, a, as a community organizer to his own family's history um, in Hartford. Um, his mother, around the age of 16, and his aunt moved from Puerto Rico and settled in and moved around um, in the North End as well as in the South End. Um, his aunt eventually settled at Bellevue Square. Um, his mother would get married. Um, his father um, worked as a window washer. They moved around to um, Enfield Street, and his mother eventually got a job at Head Start and at Community Renewal Team. The family moved between the North End and the South End of Hartford because sometimes it was driven by hardship and in other instances to find much better accommodations as their family grew. And so Josh Serrano's journey um, in Hartford would take him to Zion Street, to Magnolia Street, to Garden Street, to Bedford Street. Along the way, they adopted a cat called mm -hmm. Kitty. <laughs> so Kitty was making this journey um, as well. And finally, the family settled at the Clay Arsenal Renaissance Apartments when Josh was about 13 years old. Um, his mother eventually passed his residency down to Josh, her residency down to Josh, who then became head of household, and she moved to the Blue Hills area. His experience of numerous housing code violations helped to spur him to action, and he has been a pivotal part of the activism and the organizing against slumlords in the city of Hartford. But in the process of sharing his story with me, you hear these little snippets of Puerto Ricans settling into public housing, of Puerto Ricans moving into the Blue Hills area, um, of Puerto Ricans moving into the Clay Arsenal area, and then eventually um, drifting to the southern parts of the city. Um, and that story is is still to be told because most people associate the Blue Hills area with the African American community and the West Indian um, community. Um, here we have um, one of the posters um, that the No More Slum Lords um, community organizers posted um, around the Clay Arsenal Renaissance um, apartments. These posters were both in English and in Spanish, and we have Josh um, Serrano and um, Tara Morrison um, here. Um, engaged in one of the many, 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 many conversations um, about what was unfolding in their home. Um, here is Josh with the um, premiere of his panels that were based on um, his, um, his oral history um, interview um, with Hartford Mayor Luke Bronin and another one of the um, community organizers, Milagros Ortiz, who's also standing um, next to her panel. It was the shade tobacco industry that drew many Puerto Ricans um, here. Um, from this graph, you can see just how significantly um, migration picked up between 1950 and 1960. You can see between 1900 and 1950 that it's ebbing and flowing, but the key period um, for our purposes is between 1950 um, and 1960. Once many Puerto Ricans um, settled here because they were citizens, they could um, switch to what's called day hall um, laborers, which means that they did not have to subject themselves to the housing, um, to the housing conditions and the social conditions of living in a labor camp. Although the Puerto Rican Migration Division followed their migrants here, they were not particularly um, empowered to negotiate some of the more favorable um, terms of the contracts, the way that uh, those contracts were negotiated with West Indian men. Um, by this, I mean like West Indian recruits per 100 got a cook to come with them, and that cook would um, be responsible for making sure that the men were not miserable in eating uh, American food, like spaghetti. It's not appropriate. Spaghetti is not appropriate for West Indian men who are working really hard um, in tobacco. 
there was very little deference to Puerto Rican diets or Puerto Rican um, Puerto Rican meats. And so although the Puerto Rican government tried to protect its citizens, in a lot of instances it was toothless. Um, it was toothless to do so. And so um, shade tobacco workers, shade tobacco farmers turned to West Indian workers. Um, one of those workers was Sidney um, Barnett that you met at the beginning, who eventually, when he arrived here, um, mentioned that he could drive, right? And, and he was able to drive a truck on the farm to avoid the actual hard labor um, of working um, in the field. He eventually left the farm, settled in Hartford, um, because he took advantage of the five-year residency rule um, at the time before the McCarran-Walter Act went into um, effect, and he was able to um, apply for his citizenship because he had actually stayed in the country um, for five years. He opened up a clothing store and became a business owner and a home owner. In the oral histories that I conducted, um, with a lot of the men now deceased who participated in this labor program, um, they communicated with, with great comedy the kinds of shenanigans um, that they would use to make it through the recruitment test. They would wear other people's dentures. I don't know how that works. Uh, they gorged themselves on ripe bananas and sugary drinks to meet the weight requirements because you couldn't really be too skinny. And there were all kinds of professionals such as clerks and tailors and accountants who because of the economic downturn in the Caribbean, um, because there's very little cash flowing into the Caribbean because trade has been disrupted um, during the war, um, have no way of making money, right? During a war, you're not going to go to, tailor, to a tailor to have your next outfit um, sewn for you. So there were all sorts of professionals, um, carpenters, mechanics, tailors, who found themselves cash-strapped and thought that this was a good way for them to earn a little bit of money until the war was over. They did not necessarily intend to stay um, in the United States. It, um, this was an opportunity for them to make a little bit of money until um, the wartime exigencies were over. Um, these men would go from station to station. The U.S. government set up in um, schools. They took over um, some of the um, elementary schools. And like other military tests, right, they stripped the men butt naked, checked for scars, deformities, good teeth, hence the ventures, and having met those requirements, uh, the first 8,200 of those West Indian men um, <clears throat> finally um, arrived in the U.S. Um, in Connecticut, it is 1,000 men who first came um, in, in the latter half of um, 1943. They planted, netted, and harvested um, tobacco. And when the tobacco harvest was over, they were lent out to other farmers in Connecticut um, and in the greater Hartford and Massachusetts um, area to assist with other crops, um, for example. And then they were lent out far afield. They could be lent out to Michigan. They could be lent out mm. um, to Louisiana, right? Because the um, the sugar season, um, the sugar they could be lent out once the tobacco season um, was over, then they could go into um, the sugar season. So you have people who are going to Louisiana for sugar and then are coming back and not, not actually going back home um, for a while. Uh, a lot of these um, guest workers, and they were guest workers, they were invited um, by the U.S. government and their contracts were negotiated by Great Britain. Um, married African American women, and who had who were also in the tobacco fields. They met African American women in the tobacco fields, and this was a space of acculturation for a lot of these um, West Indian men. Marriage helped to create a nascent West Indian community, and when they tried to integrate um, themselves into Hartford, they faced tremendous discrimination. And so they decided to found their own societies. Um, they founded their own social organizations, their own religious organi organizations, as well as fraternal organizations mm -hmm. that could serve as autonomous social spaces where they did not have to um, perform elements of black respectability um, to please whites. And so it's in this context that the West Indian Social Club emerged as a really important cultural space as well um, as as well as other societies that were founded. So you have 
Um, the Caribbean American Society, for example, follows seven years later in 1957, and then Barbados and Trinidad and Tobago um, follow thereafter. Sort of the pattern is as soon as you get your independence <laughs> and you create your own society, but there's also the Cricket Hall of Fame, the Jamaica Progressive League, the women founded their own organization, so the Caribbean Ladies Cultural Organization, and across Hartford they created a really deep network, this lattice work of organizations that engaged in everything from social and economic and political um, and religious support um, for the West Indian community. And this duplicates the same sort of patterns that you see in the Puerto Rican community as well as in the African American community. Um, at the West Indian Club, um, which used to be on Barber Street, and was a renovated multifamily um, house, um, shown here, um, at the West Indian Club, but not this iteration um, of it. They then moved um, to a 17,000 square foot facility um, that used to be the ice skating, um, hmm. ice skating rink at the top of Main Street in the 3000 um, block. Um, at at the West, these are men in Windsor. Um, at the West Indian Social Club, I met Mrs. Wellison, whose whose family had moved here from the South um, as well, and she and her mother both worked um, in the tobacco fields. But she was a lifelong member of the West Indian Social Club because she had met many West Indian men, and her family had played a really important role in helping those men to integrate. Um, into the community. Um, through her oral history, she talks about how her family moved around um, in the North End trying to find the right apartment and how difficult it was for Black families um, to do so. The rents were astronomical and the housing, the conditions in the places where the rents were astronomical were abysmal. And so her family ended up moving up and down Canton Street in the 1940s, which then would be flooded by the Connecticut River at the intersection of Canton and Bellevue Street. And her father was one of the laborers who helped to build the many dikes that they constantly tried to mm. put up to prevent these floods. There was no heat and hot water in her apartment. Ice had to be bought from the trucks. Um, and clothes had to be ironed with a heavy metal iron. By the time... <laughs> By the time Mrs. Wollaston, the future Mrs. Wollaston, would uh, move to Bellevue Square, she would tell a very different kind of story. And this is really imp an important part of understanding what public housing could have been and what public housing represented, especially for the African American community that had been struggling with housing all along. It was an upward move. Um, it was an upward move for her. She remembers um, playing tennis. She remembers the, um, the rec center. She remembers the community center. She remembers feeling like she was everyone's child, that everybody was there to look out um, for, the other, um, for the other children. And this is a very different kind of image of the projects um, than the one um, that we had. Um, since we lost a little bit of time, I only want to take five more minutes. Um, there are many more. <laughs> There are many more people, and I choose to highlight these people that you are not familiar with because we could go with the historic first. We could go with the popular names that everyone is familiar with um, in Hartford. But part of the um, part of the purpose of this project is to document the experiences of ordinary um, of ordinary um, everyday people. Um, the last person that I want to um, turn to, I, I, I will skip over Ella Brown, the first African-American um, policewoman. But um, I will just briefly say, um, I, can, I can't skip over Mr. Bennett. Mr. Bennett is 98. <laughs> I mm. just celebrated his 98th, um, his 98th birthday. And he has uh, welcomed me into his home on, on, on so many um, occasions to talk about what his experience was like. He is mm. the oldest living member of the West Indian Social Club mm. um, right now, and he was among the men who came in um, 1943. Mm. Yeah, in 1943 um, to work um, in the U.S. and who eventually settled down and and was rooted in Hartford and rooted um, in um, Bloomfield. But one of the stories he tells is of um, buying multiple properties um, in Hartford and participating in that dream of using multi 
multifamily properties as a way um, towards a middle class um, life once you're settled down. And he had his sights set on a property in Bloomfield. And um, he would go there frequently because he is a huge gardener. That man gardens everything. I think his family has to keep him out of the garden still. <laughs> Um, and his this property that he was um, enamored with um, in Bluefield and that he purchased, you know, needed manicuring. And so he wanted, he visited many times and his neighbors were so friendly uh, to him. However, after finally getting the garden to the Jamaican status that he would like for a, Jama a, West, a proper West Indian garden, um, his neighbors found out that he was the owner. And they were only kind of nice to him because they thought that he was just the gardener. Once they found out that he was the owner, everything changed and they stopped talking to him, oh. one man in particular. And there are lots of stories like this about what it means to move into a neighborhood to finally, right? He has multiple houses and he finally moves into the one that gives him the garden of his dreams. And then he has to put up with this hostile um, person, um, person next door. But I, I thank Mr. Bennett for helping me, um, for letting me share um, his story. Um, I have so many more, but because we got interrupted and because I want to leave enough time for questions, let me just try, um, <clears throat> let me just try and pull all of this um, together. So between 1940 and 2020, African Americans, West Indians, and Puerto Ricans made Hartford their home. And by 1980, Hartford had become a majority minority city. And by 2010, West Indians had become the largest foreign born population in the state. They had uh, surpassed the Italian population before and then the Polish population, which had one stint in the 1990s um, as the largest foreign-born population um, in the state. Um, this makes Hartford an African-American city and a Caribbean city. These three great migrations were epic, but they were also mundane because they were in the process as Hartford was already undergoing tremendous demographic change would also undergo a different kind of demographic change, which would lead to a different kind of story um, about Hartford. Once they came, they moved around Hartford's 18 square miles, but I like to say Hartford is not really 18 square miles if you take out the parks. So if you take out the parks, it's like 12, maybe 11. It's a very small city. So imagine this tethering. <laughs> This unmooring from Puerto Rico, from Jamaica, from Trinidad, right? From Georgia, right? Almost 40% of the African American population alone here in Hartford was from Georgia. Right. Imagining, imagine this untethering, this more, sorry, unmooring and tethering in these 12 square miles of Hartford. What these communities encountered were neighbors, like Mr. Bennett's neighbors, courts, banks, municipal governments, employers, and housing authorities, who all then conspired and colluded to limit where people could live and where they could work and where they could attend school. The early phase of Hartford's massive demographic shift did lead to a lot of concerns about immigrant communities and pulling people out of um, poverty and improving their housing con housing conditions and ministering um, to these groups. But it created this discourse of the deserving poor and people who would eventually escape their first gen first generation immigrant status, you know, and sort of move up in life. And it was very much expected that they would do so. And the city was very patient with them. But the city was not patient with any other um, group of migrants, whether these are American citizens who are moving from Georgia or moving from Puerto Rico, and they certainly, certainly were not interested um, in the West Indians who were settling um, here in terms of providing um, support. And so the second set of stories that are in, um, that describe a similar demographic transformation for Hartford is now focused on white flight and deindustrialization and suburbanization 
But there are so many more stories about our state and about our towns. There are stories about home and about family, about belonging, about how you get settled into Hartford and make it your own place, about owning property like Mr. Bennett, owning property like Mr. Barnett, um, becoming a, a, a major activist um, like Senora Nunez, opening up your own barbershop, um, like Lovely Man, so many valiant efforts to establish bilingual education that paved the way for other bundles of rights by other groups of political representation. And then those stories about what Albany Avenue was like and what Barber Street um, was like and what Windsor Street um, was like, not some like crime infested area that the city had to use urban renewal to get rid of, right? Of getting the North End Senior Center up and running, of working in tobacco and having the shaped tobacco growers form these interesting bonds where they become the god godparents of people's children and where they're traveling to Jamaica to attend the weddings of their workers, right? Of building schools and social clubs and athletic clubs and fraternal organizations. These are the kinds of stories that I want to tell about Hartford, Hartford's demographic. Um, transition. These are the kinds of stories I want to tell about how people came here and built this city because that's always been the story of Hartford about how successive groups of people came here with their goals and their dreams and they tried to build the city in the vision um, that they want. And so this new initiative that my chair at UConn is um, helping to support is engaged public oral and community um, history, and this is an example of what that kind of history looks like. Thank you. All right. I apologize for the technical difficulties, but I hope some of us are back and have questions. All right. Well, thank you. And we have people in the audience here who can ask questions. People at home, uh, if you would uh, just raise your hand, um, if you can find that function. Um, and let me know that you have a question. I can have, bring you in by audio. Questions from the room? Uh, yeah. Bill? Yeah, Fiona. Uh, really magnificent. I think really this, it, what's fascinating, this idea that epic, it, it, you're capturing this huge moment of transition before it's dead. And that's so priceless because it never happens. You know, you think of all the and it, moments in history that we talk about, how many people had the presence of mind to get in and meet and speak with the founders before they go. I just love it. I want more of it. <laughs> Great. Um, Frank, I'm not seeing raise your hand. Are they doing it in the chat? Ask me to chat. Okay, we, we do. I don't see, the, I don't know if people are seeing the raised hand function. I'm not seeing any come in. But we do have a question from Brandy Culp, who asked, um, how did this majority minority status impact city planning decisions of the 1960s and beyond? So 1960s and beyond. Um, not even 1960s and beyond. So the Hartford, the Hartford Municipal Authorities have been trying to figure out how to keep people in place in certain parts of the cities um, for a really um, long time. So um, at, I don't know if I was cut off when I was mentioning um, this, but there is um, in the 19 in the 1940s, most of what the city was concerned about was like flood control and trying to figure out, and, and traffic control, and then enter Robert Moses. <laughs> enter Robert Moses, and he comes up with this brilliant plan. It is a brilliant plan. It preserves Bushnell Park, because they wanted to cut through it with traffic, the horror um, of it, um, that Hartford decided um, to follow. And his brilliant plan in 1949, so not even in 1960, his brilliant plan in, in 1949 is to get rid of the slum areas, right? Like those are the groups of people and the areas of the city um, in the North End, um, a lot in on Windsor Avenue that can be sacrificed, right? Those are the people who are 
disposable. And um, in the 19, late 1950s and 1960s, Hartford takes a lot of federal, um, uses fed, um, federal money um, and pairs it with other funding to rezone um, that area and to pretty much get rid of about 466. And I only know that number because I literally was looking at the spreadsheet last night. Um, 466 families were removed um, from that area. And if you drive down Windsor Street right now, you will see the industrial detritus <laughs> um, <laughs> that I don't know what else to call it, <laughs> um, that remain. The people are gone, <laughs> right? The, the people um, are gone. And then you see that reflected um, with the plans for I-84. But there is a long shadow of that that's stretching from the 1940s that comes to life, right, in the 1960s. And then Bill, Bill knows way more about this than I do as well. Who knows? Uh, th this notion of uh, racial redlining, which is increasingly well understood, and, and, and it certainly goes into the 60s, and at some point, there's change. And my question is, uh, does redlining sort of still exist and how does it function? Do you have any idea? Well, right now, if you read almost any headline about Hartford, you'll find, like even in the New York Times, that Hartford is one of the poorest cities um, in, the, in, the, in the United States, yeah. right? And um, the question is, how did it get? How did it get that way? And you take a generation of um, housing policies, and again, right, like this collusion, not just by the city, by the banks, by like individual um, neighbors to thwart the home ownership, um, to thwart the home ownership dreams um, of, of the local population. And even when people have the means, right, they are prevented. Um, I think Matt Ritter, um, was at a press conference a few um, weeks ago associated with Sarah Bronin's um, and uh, her many, 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 many partners initiative for desegregated CT. And he talks about how his family had to underwrite some of the, um, some of the deeds so that an African-American family could get access to housing in Bloomfield, even though they had the means. Most of the West Indian men um, that I interviewed um, at for, who were um, who came here in the 1940s also talk about how many of their um, many either of the Jewish residents who wanted to sell their homes to them or who were their friends also would have to hold the deed um, for them or even in Glaston in Glastonbury right there were folks who were interested in purchasing homes in Glastonbury and and had to get a white person to hold the deed. Um, for them. So that is like the long shadow and um, the legacy. And then separate from, you know, Hartford's little 12 square miles has a significant proportion of apartments compared to other cities of its size. Mm -hmm. And that has been a tremendous problem because it creates this housing shortage, this constant housing shortage and the housing stock of Hartford compared to a lot of other cities of its size. So not to Philly and Chicago, right, but to the Cleveland's um, of the world. Hartford's housing stock is really, is really old, um, yeah, and it leads yeah, to well, significant problems with housing. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so I, I'm seeing raised hands now. What mm -hmm. I'm going to call on, uh, there's Ruth, Pablo, and then Brandy, and there may be others after that. When I uh, call on you, I'll open your mic, and you'll be able to speak right into the room. So, Ruth Glazer. Oh, okay. Am I am I on? Yes, you are. Okay. Well, Fiona, uh, I just want to congratulate you on your research, and I would love to have a more extended conversation with you at some point. Um, I did see your exhibit at the Hartford Public Library, and, and I think it's I think it's really critically important to, to do these intertwined histories. Um, one of the things that I, I wanted to mention, um, and obviously I'm, this is going to be part of your work um, from what I've seen, is that it's really important to disaggregate the the, the uh, 
correlation from causality aspects of the deterioration of places like Hartford um, and the arrival of these groups just about the same time that deindustrialization was taking place. And I just wanted to mention that I've recently read and used Yana Barber's book on Lawrence Mass, which I don't know if you're familiar with it, but it speaks to that issue. And it really very strongly disabuses that myth that, in, and taught, and in, you know, there are interviews with whites about it's this element and this group of people who ruined our city. And she really demolishes that and talks about deindustrialization and the unfortunate coincidence of that happening at that time. So I just wanted to mention that to say that I think, you know, it's important to do these intertwined histories. And I'm just wondering along those lines, what the connections are between the Puerto Rican community and the West Indian community. Because you've mentioned the African Americans intermarrying with the West Indians, but we I don't I'm not sure what the connections are, if there are connections. Because in my research I see the West Indians coming to work in tobacco, then they're deportable and of course some stay behind. And then Puerto Ricans came after them. So I don't know whether these are parallel histories or they intertwined histories. So that's sort of my question. Oh, thank you. There's so much to um, unpack there. Thank you, Ruth. So Ruth's, uh, Ruth's research, right, is also another great uh, Connecticut Humanities um, product for her book, Akime Kato. Thank you. Thank you um, for that. And I'm going to be on a panel, uh, maybe virtually with Barbara. Um, so we should have an we should have an opportunity um, to talk. Uh, most of the shade tobacco growers um, pleaded um, to be able to continue to use West Indian workers at after the war um, after the war ended, and so some of these men are able to stay here um, into 1950. But then there is a directive that you need to use migrant citizens and the, the migrant citizens that you're going to use should be um, Puerto Ricans. And so instead of creating, instead of creating an opportunity, right, for these sort of disparate groups who are in the tobacco fields and have an opportunity to engage each other, in, instead of having this moment of solidarity, which does unfold with the African-American community, um, the, the US government pits the Puerto Rican government against the rest of the West Indian, um, oh. West Indian government. And, and they had been doing that sort of thing by negotiating the kind of contract that says, yes, you get to have your cooks because we don't want West Indian men to mutiny on when they're, and then giving Puerto Ricans the worst sloppy sloppiest food these gigantic nasty disgusting buckets of like macaroni and cheese and cheese probably that's like Velveeta made of plastic the, the worst <laughs> the worst food you could possibly think of and completely ignoring all of the um, attempts of the Puerto Rican social workers who are advocating for the um, for the Puerto Rican um, farm laborers to try to improve their housing um, conditions. So on the one hand, West Indians are deportable, but because they're deportable, there there's a few more concessions are made mm. to them. And then they sort of wave the wand of citizenship when they feel like it, right? They, they don't want to acknowledge Puerto Ricans were citizens at any other time. Um, but they wave the wand of citizenship to the shade tobacco growers and encourage them to use Puerto Rican workers. And this lasts into the 70s and then has worth has shown, you know, like attempts um, by Chavez, his um, um, union to unionize um, Puerto Rican workers completely shuts that down. And you see this huge drop off of Puerto Rican workers being exclusively recruited for um, for shade tobacco. And they continue to use West Indian workers, of course, because the shade tobacco growers team up with everybody. They team up with farmers in Wisconsin, in Michigan, in New York, in Florida, and in Louisiana to lobby Congress to extend the temporary guest worker program beyond the life of World War, beyond the life of World War II. Thank you, Ruth. Um, to uh, Pablo Delano. That's my Trinity party. <laughs> <laughs> 
Fiona, I, I, actually, I didn't raise my hand, and I don't have a question, so I don't know how I got in the queue. <laughs> but I, I, I wasn't going to miss this talk, which was wonderful. But since I'm here, I, I may as well ask a question. <laughs> so can you talk a little bit more about the relationship between the encouragement uh, to use Puerto Rican workers in the tobacco field and specifically Operation Bootstrap in Puerto Rico and, and the and the because that was a component of Operation Bootstrap, right? The the push to depopulate Puerto Rico, which was perceived as being too dense in population. And and also maybe the role of WPA thinking in in, in that whole equation. Right. And so one of the, you know, one of the interesting things for us to um, make sense of the experiences of these three groups is to look at, at what's going on if we want to call them the sending regions, right? If we look at what the push factors are in the West Indies that's um, pushing um, men um, onto the labor market, and that is particularly because they've already been um, involved in circum-Caribbean migration, meaning that West Indians, West Indians have always looked outside of their islands, right? And so the Jamaicans have gone to Costa Rica, Costa Rica to work. They've gone to Cuba to work. They've gone to Honduras. They've always seen the Caribbean as their wider sphere. And so it's not that America is the golden ticket. It's like the world is the golden ticket. They will go anywhere um, to work. And so that's those are the push factors, but for Puerto Rico, Puerto Rico is being encouraged, encouraged to industrialize, right? And the government is actively encouraging um, its citizens to relocate to the United States because the island um, is overpopulated, right? And we've heard all of this discourse. Um, before. And unfortunately, the more industrialized Puerto Rico becomes, it then kind of feeds on itself because a lot of lands are taken over and even more privatized. And you have U.S. companies sort of stepping in and grabbing more and more territory and sort of undermining Puerto Rico's own agricultural industry, right? A lot of the workers in Puerto Rico already have a agricultural experience by working in tobacco in Puerto Rico. Those kinds of experiences um, dry up. A lot of workers have, a lot of Puerto Rican workers have experience working in sugarcane, right? And the harvest is over here and they come and they do temporary work. That opportunity is also drying up in Puerto Rico. And so Operation Bootstrap has the effect of actually worsening the problem part of it was meant, um, it was meant um, to solve. Um, Pablo, I actually, I'm not sure um, what you were referring to with the WPA. A lot of a lot of uh, Operation Bootstrap, the ideas behind Operation Bootstrap and industrialization and modernization and all that were based on some of the FDR ideas for um, uh, you know uh, um, uh, addressing the Dust Bowl and issues in the states. So, I'm just curious as to, to to what degree are you aware of any kind of push that might have gone from Washington to the Munoz administration in Puerto Rico, for example, to, um, to uh, you know, to, to encourage this um, exportation of labor. I don't think I can speak properly, um, properly to that, but I do know that um, there is the, the, the kind of conventional push factors that we think um, about now that propels um, migration, um, that these policies in the 1930s and in, in the 1940s and, and the U.S. relationship with Puerto Rico, right, this sort of like transnational colonial relationship just provides this free reign for U.S. capital and U.S. companies um, to operate and to make it really, really, really difficult for people to either get access to land or even to be gainfully employed in their own country with the government, with the Puerto Rican government kind of having to prostrate itself in this very supplicant <laughs> uh, demeaning way to encourage its population to move to the U.S. and then having to set up a migration division in 30 countries to deal with the social problems that they know are going to 
um, that they know we're going to um, follow them. So I would definitely lay this at the footsteps of the U.S. government for making like poverty and unemployment <laughs> worse and then creating further problems for Puerto Rican um, migrants as they settle in the United States. Right. Thanks for coming up with a question, Pablo. <laughs> uh, Ruth, Ruth, did you want to add something to that? Yeah. Um, yeah. I just. I guess I wanted to add a couple of things. Um, one is that um, you know, um, Fiona said that that the Puerto Rican uh, Migration Division wasn't very good about protecting the rights of workers, as compared to the advocacy for West Indians. And I think that Operation Bootstrap, which uh, Pablo mentioned, of course, is one of the reasons, because the island needed that safety valve. They wanted people to leave the island. They had to have people leave the island so that they could ostensibly show that the industrialization of the island was working, but it wouldn't work unless tens of thousands of people left. So when it came up down to standing up for workers' rights, in the tobacco fields and other areas, they weren't very good about it because they didn't want to create a situation in which people, in which the uh, farmers would say, okay, well then go back to the island. And then I just also wanted to mention that um, there is a WPA connection in the sense that Rexford Tugwell was involved with FDR's administration, and he was also, I think, at one point, um, the governor of Puerto Rico, or you know, he was an official in Puerto Rico as well. So there is a, there that there is that WPA connection in that one person at least. Thank you, thank you. That's definitely going to be an area that I investigate, and I I don't I don't I I want to be very careful about how I'm painting how I'm painting the migration division from like the thirty thousand foot view of the Puerto Rican government versus the actual staff, right, of the migration division, which has the best of intentions for the workers, but they the the limitations of the Puerto Rican government make them relatively toothless when it comes to really being able to push for some of the demands. Because the worst thing, the 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 worst thing that the shade tobacco growers or or the or the sugar growers or the folks in Wisconsin and the folks in Minnesota or the apple um, or the folks who grow apple, they do not want to hear anything about labor organizing. Um, labor organizing or about uniniz unionization, right? And as the community workers who are attached to the migration division see the sentiments swelling up among the um, workers as one of the ways to try to address the horrible conditions, um, it creates this huge tension because that is going to destroy any guest worker program. And I guess the only other thing I wanted to say is that Unfortunately, in 2020, even before COVID, um, in 2019, um, it's a race to the bottom for migrant workers, right? So West Indians had some of the, they, they got a lot of concessions because they're ultimately deportable, right? But even those very basic concessions are being slowly eroded by like the current labor agreements that still bring West Indian workers here to work in sugarcane, to work in apple. They're doing a lot of sod work now, mm -hmm. like on um, golf turf. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, and even a provision like mandatory savings or healthcare, which was not controversial. <laughs> it's their own money. So even some of those provisions now, the U.S. government is pitting other migrant workers against the West Indian government to say, they, you guys can't have this cushy contract. Um, and the farmers are stuck in the middle, the workers are stuck um, in the middle, and ultimately it's just part of this story of labor losing out in general and migrant labor losing out in the worst, in the worst way. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, um, are there any questions in the room here? I think we're right about at the end of our time. Yeah. And uh, I think we've answered all the questions. You've answered all the questions <laughs> online. I didn't do anything. I've um, tried. And thank you. Thank you to all of you. Sorry you got kicked off, but yeah. you guys crashed the system because there were so many of you. Yeah. And that's my story, and I'm sticking. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sticking with it. And I just also wanted to say to Ruth and Emma and all of the other 
um, historians um, who work in Puerto Rican um, history, like thanking you, thank you for letting me step into your space, right? And thank you for welcoming me and guiding me and sort of, you know, helping me see whether that's shortcomings or pointing me to um, new sources. It's really going to be interesting to try to write this common history, but it has to be done. Right. It, it definitely needs to be done, because as long as we can continue to tell these very different stories and we don't search out the very sort of the, the housing issues, the sort of same sort of the sort the same sort of community based political activism and benevolence, we're going to continue to see the stories that Hartford is among the poorest cities and that notion of um, poverty and that people, um, that the people who are poor, right, somehow are complicit in their own poverty and complicit in how horrible their school systems are, are complicit in the fact that they can't get decent jobs in the city where they live, are complicit in the fact that so many of Hartford's residents don't qualify for the really good paying jobs in the city, right? The story of complicity that underpins the story we tell about poverty, that's what I want this book to sort of step away from and step into this um, space and think about how the city, um, how these particular groups made the city and built um, this city and sustained the city. So thank like you. Like and follow for part two. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Okay, thank you everyone and good night. Thank you, Fiona.